So we're dealing with ideal gas mixtures. We've talked about just a re any general mixture of ideal gases and then how to get the properties and then how to analyze it as it undergoes uh, energy balance, first law for a closed system, as well as an exergy balance, the second law for a closed system. And we can do first law analysis for open systems where there's brink mixing or flow through a compressor, throw through a turbine, nozzle, as well as a second law analysis. So once we get the way to and calculate the properties for ideal gases, then we can go back and redo all the first and second law analyses that we've done before. Now I'd like to talk about psychrometrics. What is psychrometrics? Just like I used to look up a word in a dictionary if I was unfamiliar with it, now you just look it up in the online dictionary, right? And you can read a lot about it. So look up psychrometrics. Um, it's not to be confused with the word that does not have an R. So that's the discipline of psychology and education. But psychrometrics deals with the study of moist air. So psychrometrics is a term, or psychrometry, or hygrometry. These are terms in the field of engineering that is used to describe the physical and thermodynamic properties of gas vapor mixtures. That vapor is H2O, water vapor. The gas, dry air. So what is dry air? Dry air, we use the symbol DA as a subscript. Let's say I'm going to talk about partial pressure of the dry air. I may use the subscript DA. It's a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen. Then what the third most common component may be something like argon, or it could be carbon dioxide, or it could be some other constituent. could be water. But if it's dry, we exclude the water from the calculation. It's just no water vapor in it, okay? So um, there, it could be some helium in there. Well, it gets too complex when you have helium and carbon dioxide and argon. So dry air for a lot of calculations is just going to be 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. Is that 79% either a mass fraction or a mole fraction? It's a mole fraction. It's a mole fraction, okay? So it's 79%, that would be Y of N2. And the 21% would be Y of O2, the mole fractions. So you can then calculate the mixture or the dry air molar mass, and it comes in at 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. You know, that was the molar mass reported. First table of our appendix right near the top. The second line down in the appendix table A1, it says air equivalent. And then column over here, 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. You've used it a number of times for air. Now, we always did calculations for dry air, but now we can consider moisture in the air. Okay. Now, if I round this off, I'm going to round that off to 29 kilograms per kilomole. So the molar mass of dry air, 29 kilograms per kilomole, or if you want four significant digits, 28.97. Right. What is moist air then? Well, it's dry air plus water vapor. And we treat dry air as one constituent. We know it's a mixture, but we just say, oh, it's dry air. And then we can treat the second constituent as water vapor. The water vapor has a molar mass for H2O, water. It's equal to 18.02 kilograms per kilomole. True? Or if you want to round it off, it's just 18. Uh, that is in table A1 near the bottom. Actually, it is the last entry in that table. Water, molar mass, 18.02 kilograms per kilomole. This vapor, as well as the dry air, always behave as an ideal gas. That's our assumption. It's justified by numerous observations, experimental observations. The water vapor behaves as an ideal gas. What is saturated air? Well, we can stuff so much 
water vapor into the air and then it becomes completely saturated. You can't have any more water vapor in the air. Okay, it's saturated air. You probably experience saturated air on a very hot, humid day right after a rain shower. It feels like, mm, you can feel it. It's very humid, especially if you're in New Orleans, somewhere in Louisiana, you know, Houston, right? When we studied um, ideal gas mixtures, we had the concept of partial pressure. And the sum of the partial pressure is equal to the total pressure. Well, the total air pressure is made up of the contribution from the dry air plus the contribution from the vapor in the air. So the sum of them equal to the atmospheric pressure. Standard atmospheric pressure, do you recall? 101.3, if you want more digits, 101.325, way too many digits. Kilopascal, or 14.7 PSI, oh, we want more digits, 14.696 PSIA. Forget all those digits, right? It fluctuates. You got a high pressure zone over here, low pressure zone over here. The atmospheric pressure changes. All right. But roughly, you could say 101 kilopascal, 14.7 psi. So the sum of the partial pressure dry air and the vapor pressure is the total air pressure. What is the vapor pressure when you have very dry air? What's the partial pressure of the water vapor in very dry air? You're in the middle of Arizona. If there's no water anywhere. Summer. Zero. Zero. Now, when you start going to Houston, hot, humid climate, right after rain, shower, all that, this goes way up. So that's the, very, that's the great variable is what's the partial pressure of the water vapor in the moist air? What is the maximum possible partial pressure of the water vapor in the moist air. It's when it's saturated air. What is going to be the maximum PV? It'll be the saturation pressure at that temperature of the air. Because the temperature of the air is the same, the temperature of the dry air in the mixture, as well as the temperature of the vapor in the moist air mixture. So if your thermometer is showing a temperature, that's our dry bulb temperature, and so that's the temperature at which you would evaluate the saturation pressure. And that would be then the maximum vapor pressure. It's for, it, when you have saturated air, the partial pressure of the vapor in the moist air is the saturation pressure. There's three temperatures that you have to become familiar with and two humidities. Let's just introduce them. Some of them are really easy, some of them are a little abstract. Three temperatures. The first temperature is what they call the dry bulb temperature. It's what the thermometer is reading in this room back there. It's the predominant temperature that you talk about. You say, what's the temperature in this room? People say, oh, it's about 75 degrees F. That's the dry bulb temperature. So if I had a thermometer in this room, that's what it would show. What's the dew point temperature? If you start cooling this room without letting any more moisture in or out. You start cooling it, it'll become saturated air, and it will, if you cool it some more, it'll want to condense. It will do out. You will start to get a water film on the top of the tables and the floor and other things. It'll, it'll be water molecules bouncing around up there in the air, and then it'll get so cold that it will be less energetic. When they bounce, they start to stick. There'll be groups of molecules. The density is much higher than air or the vapor in the air when they're not sticking together. They're coalescing when it's cold, and they'll start on the influence of gravity to settle, and they'll settle out straight down. How many people have wondered where that water came from on their front yard in the middle of the morning? You know, you get up, you walk out, and your shoes are all wet. That's doing out because during the night, the, dry, the air temperature dropped below the dew point. It hit the dew point and then continued to drop. More moisture was wrung out and dewed out. Let's say on your car window, right? You, you get in the car, you got to start it up unless it's in a garage, but you have to turn the wiper on. What are you wiping away? Always the dew that came out of the air uh, during the night. Okay? You take whatever beverage you like out of the refrigerator, and you are drinking it on a hot summer day, 
you put on a table and all of a sudden the outside of that can is all full of water droplets and they coalesce and then they slide down and they put a big ring on the table. Somebody says, you know, put, put a coaster under that beverage or you keep wiping it. Where did that water come from? From the air. The temperature of the can is at or below the dew point temperature of the air in the room. This is a concept of the dew point temperature. So right now we could calculate the dew point temperature of the air in this room. Oh, I'm not saying the physical temperature is the dew point temperature. It's just to say if theoretically we cooled the air in this room to that temperature, the dew point temperature, then it would start to dew out. It would become saturated air. So how do you calculate this dew point temperature? I know how to measure the dry bulb temperature, have an instrument like that, a thermocouple on the wall. That's pretty easy. But how do I measure the dew point temperature? Well, it's the same concept here that it's when the actual partial pressure of the water vapor is equal to the saturation pressure at that dew point. So what you do is you say, go tell me what is the partial pressure of the water vapor in this room right now. Oh, it'll be some value. Let's say it's 2 kilopascal. Now tell me the temperature such that the water vapor pressure or the saturation pressure is exactly 2 kilopascal. That temperature is the dew point temperature. The next temperature is a, called a wet bulb temperature. If I have a device like a psych sling psychrometer, which I have in my hand, okay, this device measures the wet bulb temperature. And I'm going to pass it around. It's a simple device. The concept behind the wet bulb temperature is easy to understand. It's evaporative cooling. Why do people, you know, in the summer and they're hot and they have a t-shirt on, why do they put a wet t-shirt on or make the t-shirt wet? It's so that they can enjoy evaporative cooling. So this device right here is made by uh, this company. This is the exact one model right here. It, instead of being filled with mercury, it's filled with red spirit in the thermometers. It has two thermometers in it. And you pull it apart like this, and it hinges right here. And what you do is you sling it in a circle. This is high tech, OK? <laughs> uh, yes, they still use these. All right. So what it is is you have two thermometers. And when you sling it, the air is going over the bulbs, around the bulbs, OK? The radius, they're at the end of where it's being slung. Here is the exposed bulb. This one is clothed. It's clothed with a little sock. It is kept wet by a wick material. The sock goes into a little reservoir right here. And I put a little water in it, maybe a drop will come out, but it's wet in there, okay? And so it's, it maintains the one bulb to be wet. The wet bulb, the original. And then the other bulb is dry, it's the dry bulb. And when I sling it around, the dry bulb will measure the same temperature as the temperature back there on the wall. But the wet bulb temperature will be lower. It'll be a lot lower if it's very dry in this room because the evaporative cooling off of that wet sock that's covering that wet bulb, keeping it wet, will, will feel the very rapid evaporative cooling. It'll be lower temperature. Okay. If it's not very low compared to the dry bulb, that means it's very moist in here. It's, it's a high relative humidity. There's a lot of water vapor. There's not a lot of potential to evaporate. So I just stopped slinging, and I'm showing about 57, 58 wet bulb and about 72 dry bulb. So that's the recipe. You sling it. You sling it around for about one and a half minutes. You measure the wet bulb temperature. You measure the dry bulb temperature. Then the hard part, you have to remember the two readings for at least 30 seconds. All right, um, that's hard for me. I got to remember now. Okay, we're at 58 and 72. So then you slide the unit back together. That's hard too. You got to get it matched up. And you have two sides. It doesn't matter. One is for higher temperature and then one is lower temperature. And you match up what they're showing you right here is the dry bulb and the wet bulb. So I find where 
on the scale as I slide back and forth, I find the wet bulb is 60. Is that what I said? 58, even worse. 58, and the dry bulb is 72. So I find the wet bulb, I slide the dry bulb to 72 until they line straight up. So the wet bulb of 60 marker lines up with the dry bulb of 72 marker. Please, everybody, do that. I mean, you really should. This is low tech. And then you, you read on the third scale what the relative humidity is. And it says it's around 42% relative humidity in this room. So I'll pass that around for your enjoyment. So how many temperatures are there? There are three temperatures. Now, the other one, the wet bulb, it's, it's, it's a sense of how little humidity there is or how much humidity there is, how dry the air is. And so you'll have a big difference between the dry bulb. The wet bulb will be a lot lower if it's very dry air. The two humidities, well, the easy one is relative humidity. So everybody says, oh, the temperature in this room, 75 degrees F, 72 degrees F, 40% humidity, 30% humidity, 50% humidity. This is often reported in the news. But what exactly is relative humidity? What is it? Well, phi is the mole fraction of the vapor in the current moist air mixture divided by the maximum mole fraction of the vapor if it would be saturated, if it would be saturated air at the same temperature. Don't go changing the dry bulb temperature. Because we know if you start to increase the dry bulb temperature of the air, it can hold a whole lot more moisture. And if it's a lower temperature air, It'll feel dry even though it may have a high relative humidity. It can't hold a lot of moisture. Now, what is the relationship? What is the relationship here? We said that the partial pressure of vapor plus the partial pressure of the dry air is the sum of the total pressure. Is it also true that the partial pressure or the, the mole fraction of the vapor times the total mixture pressure, the total air pressure, is equal to the partial pressure of the vapor. Do you remember that equation, Dalton's law? So we can divide over by P right here. And so the mole fraction of the vapor is equal to the ratio of the partial pressure divided by the total pressure. So the numerator is PV over P. And then you have, in the denominator, you have P sat, the maximum, divided by the same pressure. You cancel the pressures. And so the relative humidity may be defined as the ratio of mole fractions, but in practice, everybody talks about, oh, the relative humidity is the vapor pressure compared to the maximum it could be, which is the saturation pressure at that temperature, at that dry bulb temperature, okay? So that's the relative humidity. The last one is humidity ratio, omega. Let's define it. It's the mass of vapor in a mixture. Let's think about one cubic meter of volume. If I gave you, I said, look, here's a cubic meter or a cubic foot. You would be able to say, OK, how much mass of vapor is in that cubic foot? Calculate it. Divide it by the mass of the dry air in the same cubic foot or cubic meter, the same volume. The ratio of the mass of vapor to the mass of air. Or you could think density of vapor to the density of dry air. This DA on this M means it's the dry air mass. Why would engineers find this term humidity ratio to be of use? It's because we have ducts and they move air around. And we may bring it into a device, and maybe this device is a cooling coil. And this cooling coil has cold water in it, or refrigerant. And the air flows over it, and the temperature of the air goes low. Not only does it go low because it's being cooled, it goes below the dew point temperature of that inlet air. What happens? You better have a pan to collect something on the bottom and take it out. What are you going to collect off the bottom of that coil? Do the water, the liquid. 
So what happens is, is the vapor content can go up or down as the air flows through your building. As it goes over a cooling coil, it typically is dehumidified. But the mass flow rate of the dry air, the nitrogen and oxygen, stays constant. That's why we like this ratio. The mass flow rate of the dry air stays constant. The water goes up and down. Think about this. You're exhaling in this room. You're inhaling and exhaling. What are you pumping into this room? Each individual here, you're putting out CO2 every time you exhale, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. And heat, I know, but water vapor. As a design engineer for a building, you want to maybe maintain the humidity and the temperature in a zone. And so you'll have to figure out, okay, I need to bring in air that's cool and dry. Mix it and remove out warmer, humid air out. Now, humans aren't bad, but let's say you had a thousand coffee pots in here, belching out a lot of water vapor, or another piece of machinery that had a lot of humidity that was generating humidity in a room, then it has, it has to be dealt with. The engineer has to consider that. And especially if you have something that's sensitive to humidity, now, you guys aren't too sensitive. You're pretty happy. Yeah. But if you had a piece of artwork that was worth, you know, $100,000, you're at the Witty Museum. Believe me, the engineers, I, I, I talked to one guy that worked that, you know, worried about that, had to redesign. They have to control temperature and humidity to very tight specs if they have old books, old artwork, and other things. Because high humidity or low humidity can damage that, that uh, the artwork. So this ratio is useful and it's very helpful because the dry air mass flow rate stays constant through a lot of the calculations and the vapor is going up and down. Let's solve some problems. Moist air is uh, at 100 kPa, 30 degrees C and 84% relative humidity. The air is cooled at constant pressure. Determine the relative humidity of the air if it's cooled to 29 degrees C or cooled to 28 C or cooled to 27, et cetera. You're cooling it, okay? Let's review some information. What is this 100 kPa? You have three pressures. It could be the total pressure, it could be the pressure of the dry air, or it could be the pressure of the vapor. What do you think it is? P. It's a total pressure. It's a total pressure, right? Now, it says it's at 30 degrees C. Ooh, I had three temperatures. Is that the dry bulb, the wet bulb, or the dew point temperature that they gave me? It's a dry bulb temperature. Temperature dry bulb is 30 degrees C. And the relative humidity. Oh, what symbol did they give me for relative humidity? And it's 84%. He said it was defined as a ratio of mole fractions, but he said in practice it was a ratio of partial pressures. So there's my hint for you. See how far you can go on this, okay? I'm going to pause and walk around. Give me the answer for part A and then B and then C, etc. Pick it up here. So one thing is I forgot to emphasize, note this information is given so you don't need to go to the tables. The saturation pressure at 30 degrees C is this many kilopascal. At 29, it's this many kilopascal, right? Notice that as the temperature goes down, the, the, the saturation pressure goes down. As the temperature goes up, the saturation pressure goes up. Okay. When you cool it, it tries to maintain the same partial pressure of the vapor because that's how much moisture is in it. It exerts that pressure. And you're cooling it at the same total pressure. So what happens is, is when you cool it to 29 degrees C, the relative humidity is the current partial pressure of the vapor, which didn't change, but you divide it by the saturation pressure now at 29 degrees C. So this relative humidity, it started the partial pressure of the current vapor divided by the saturation pressure at that dry bulb temperature of 30 degrees C. So PV to start with is 84% times this pressure right here, 4.247 kPa. Then you come over here, and then you divide it by the saturation pressure at the new dry bulb temperature, 29 degrees C, and you get a relative humidity that's 89%. This fools people a little bit. 
Hey, the humidity's up. Is there more moisture in the air? No, there's not. There's not more moisture in the air. All it did was it's cooler, and so the air can't hold as much. It still holds the same amount as what it started with. But when you continue to cool, if you cool to 28, what does the humidity do? How many? Did it get 90-something percent? Now, the one you get to 27, look at this number. Look at this number. The actual partial pressure is equal to the saturation pressure. You calculate the relative humidity to be 100%. When you cool it to 27 degrees, it's now saturated air. Let me ask a question. Back here, I said this is the condition of the air. Can you tell me the dew point temperature for that air? Before we started cooling it, what's the dew point temperature of that air? 27 degrees C. Meaning if I just take that air and start cooling it, when it hits 27, it'll be saturated air. I can't cool it anymore. Oh, well, you can compute something like, oh, this is 103% or something, whatever. You can't get 103% relative humidity. What will happen? Stuff will start doing out. PV will be maxed out. It'll always equal to the saturation pressure.